Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Nancy Huang. I am a Bachelor's of Social Work student. I attended the Jack Layton Leadership School and I had a student placement with the Jack Layton Chair at Ryerson University. Uh, for me personally, I'm interested in online communities where people have the space to express their interests and express their voice through these online personas that they create. And I feel that through these personas, they can explore different identities and understand themselves better. So Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Olivia Chow for the Layton Short. Uh, this short is part of the social justice during COVID-19 series put on by the Jack Layton Chair. Um, and also to give everyone a bit of context of Olivia, just in case you might not know her too well, Olivia Chow is the founder and academic lead for the Institute for Change Leaders. She has taught over 3,500 people across Ontario, including workshops in the Jack Layton uh, Leadership School. And until 2015, Olivia held elected office for 30 years as a school trustee, city councillor, and a member of parliament. She has tirelessly championed for a universal early childhood education program, a national public transit strategy, and fair immigration policy. So Olivia, thank you so much for being here today. Hi. <laughs> uh, so to begin, um, I want to ask you one question first. Uh, can you give me an overall description of the work that you do and tell me what you're currently working on? Mm -hmm. uh, we teach people that have uh, passion uh, with an idea uh, in making change in this world. And we teach them uh, to question themselves as to why they want to be a change maker mm -hmm. and what is their core value, what is what are the major challenges they face in their life that shape them? Mm -hmm. And then we teach them how to take the story of themselves and connect with others to, and bring others on board as leaders. Mm -hmm. And then they would work on a key goal, key organizing goal. It could be, for example, defunding the police by X percentage. If that is the goal, what is the strategy? Who has the power to make that change? Uh, those people that have power, what do they want from you and your team? What kind of resources do you have as a team? How do you recruit other people to join your team? And once you have located power, mapping power, then how to, what kind of strategy are you gonna take? And what's the difference between strategy and tactics? And what tactics are you going to use? Like having a rally is a tactic, it's not a strategy. Uh, and signing a petition is a tactic, it's not a strategy. Okay, what is the overall theory of change on the, on the strategy? And then, and then from there, they come up with an action plan uh, and decide on who does what by when in order to achieve their goals. So the Institute for Change Leaders in the last few years have, changed, have trained thousands of people. The figure you're using was two years ago. We've now trained over 6,000 people. Wow! Yes, and so recently, recently we've trained hundreds online, um, 200 black youth. Uh, we've been training Americans, uh, people from Illinois. Um, that wants to participate in the November election in the United States of America. Uh, we've trained Rwanda refugees, uh, former refugees mm -hmm. uh, in Canada. Um, they're Africans, but uh, some of them are from Nigeria and Ethiopia. Um, we trained um, over a hundred childcare workers on how to make their workplace better with decent wages. Uh, personal support workers. Um, so really people that uh, feel that there, there needs to be change in either their work, their life, or their environment, they come to the Institute for Change Leaders and we give them some tools that they could use to empower themselves and empower others to, uh, to make the change they want. Wow, that's such an elaborate answer. If you don't mind me asking, uh, do you have any personal favorites in terms of strategies you might suggest to people? Uh, no, it's not up to me to determine what strategy it is. It depends on what is the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have a goal, then we can then come and sort out 
who are your allies, who are your opposition, what do you need to do in order to get to that goal? So it's not a personal strategy. It really depends on the team, what mm -hmm. kind of resources they have, how strong are their relationship with each other. And uh, it, it, it depends on each group. Very, hmm, very good answer. Thank you. And uh, another question here. So how did you come to do all this work? Did how do I to, what? How did you come to do all this work? Oh, okay. Um, I started teaching uh, feminist political action even when I was a city councilor. Oh. But once I went to become a member of parliament, I had to be in Ottawa most of the time, so I couldn't teach. So I taught that for six years. And then once I stopped being elected as a member of parliament in 2014, 2015, um, I've always uh, had an interest in political uh, organizing. Well, mm -hmm. done that for 30 plus years. So um, the, the curriculum that I teach is based on uh, a very famous professor called Marshall Gans at Harvard University. And Marshall Gans material uh, students uh, all around the globe, and he has uh, uh, he he put into practice. Uh, he teach it in a way that is uh, very useful and practical, very mm -hmm. hands on. So the materials I use, uh, it's really uh, Harvard Kennedy School executive program through Marshall Gans materials. Mm -hmm. And I've two certificates from Harvard um, that uh, because I have those certificates, I'm able to have the curriculum and Marshall are totally fine with us teaching his materials here in Canada. So we are the first and the only um, accredited, uh, well, because Ryerson University also offer a course uh, for, for me, SSH 502, and uh, we are teaching it through university, but also through the Institute for Change Leaders. SSH 502, uh, what, what's the title of this course? Like, what's the name of it? Um, it is called uh, Community Action Research. Ooh, it's okay. not as much as research, as more of the action. So focus okay. on the first two words, community action. Community action, okay, <laughs> the key. <laughs> yeah. The research piece is, you know, researching who you have on your side, right? Uh, it is power mapping. So, but power mapping, if I say power mapping is hard for people to understand, whereas the research version is easier. So research, it's not so much like statistics and going to interview people and that sort of, okay, so it's not, okay. No, it's really about mapping who's on your side, who's not. Mm -hmm. Do they have power, do they not? Who are the people that are neutral? And those that are neutral, those that have a lot of power, how do you get to them, right? So okay. you need to do the kind of research. Okay, if you're lobbying a member of parliament in your writing, how many votes did that member of parliament win by? What mm -hmm. party is he or she belongs to? And uh, what is his critic portfolio, right? You know, those are research Ooh. you need to do in order to have impact on your own elected representative. Oh, I see. That's wow. the power of mapping, right? That's a lot to think about. Okay, wow. It's worth, worth knowing if you're going to call up your city council and say, hey, we think you <laughs> should really vote in favor of uh, transferring a big chunk of money that you spend on police, transfer to youth recreation or, yeah. uh, or public transit, okay? To lower the cost of uh, students' fares. Okay, if that's what you're pushing for, did your city councilor, did he just win? He won by how much? How mm -hmm. many votes? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is his voting record? You need to do some of that research in order to know who you're talking to, right? Yeah, totally. And moving forward, so how has your work changed in light of COVID-19? Um, how does it change? Uh, <laughs> we're busier. <laughs> because there are more people that have a bit more time mm -hmm. to, to, to learn more, you know, um, because they are now at home 
we we started the institute started online training last year oh. uh, so all our curriculum has been online already anyway so when COVID happened we our office we then moved out of our Ryerson office and all work from home but because we uh, have been teaching online mm-hmm. Uh, for a full year already, it was very easy to convert all our contracts to be online. And, uh, mm-hmm. and we found that when it's online, if you design it properly with good polling, with good breakout rooms, lots of interaction, uh, small groups, bigger groups, a lot of dialogue. Dialogue is important, fun. yeah. Oh yeah, dialogue is important. You don't go ba 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 the full forty five minutes. Like maximum time you can count, like you know, five minutes or so, three to five minutes. You need a response. If not, people go, oh my god, this is boring. So how does the online format look like? Do you have like live Zoom meetings? Is is are things recorded it's, or? It's for Zoom. Okay. It's our group. Um, and we ask you to turn on your camera. We ask you to put chats, you know, question, question you have, comments on chat. We have a chat monitor. Oh, we have okay. a timer so that, you know, if this piece is three minutes, we are doing three minutes and we move it. Yeah, we're very, very straight. You know, if, if the training is two hours, it's going to be two hours, hour and a half. We also find that you cannot do more than two hours. You always need to have a break in between. Um, so there are standard stuff. Uh, that you could use. You can, rather than people raising hands, you can still do hand raising in Zoom, uh, mm-hmm. but you could also have uh, um, the breakout rooms are really great, and you could use a Google Drive and uh, say a Google Doc or a Google yeah. Sheet. Mm-hmm. People can participate and write, write on the document mm-hmm. so that you can share your screen and look at the document as everybody participate in putting what they want in there. So there are many ways to make it very interactive. Discussion threads as well? Say that again? Do you also have like discussion threads too? Is there a session? Like you know how uh, with D2L, for example, we have like discussion threads. Uh, sometimes they can be great because lots of students participate, but other times it could be the blah, 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 like you mentioned. Uh, the, dis- the discussion, we, well, we ask people to type in, depends on number of students. We've had, you know, 200, 100, sometimes 25, depends on the size of it. Mm, okay. um, we ask people to, to mute themselves, that if they have something to say, they you can put up their hands, uh, you know, um, or uh, like I just put up my hands, you know, Ooh, yeah. and uh, I can just lower my hands. <laughs> so if I want to... Uh, mute myself. I could invite other people. I could raise my hand saying, oh, yeah, 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 please, you know, or you could, I could write something in the chat and, uh, and, and say something, you know, I just written to you right now in the Mm -hmm. chat and you could write your comments in the chat and that would be, and then I will unmute you and have you make the comment and you know have other people coming so you can, it's totally 100 percent interactive that's so great your, your course sounds so engaging moving on to the next question here so what inspired you to pursue social justice especially considering that um, with asian families they don't generally advocate pursuing politics as a career because there, there is that tendency to like favor let's say a stable job so there's that curiosity of how did you yeah like why or how um, I didn't start off wanting to be, become a politician. Mm-hmm. I got involved, uh, uh, I got politicized by a group of my friends uh, oh, that was protesting okay. something called, uh, you know, it's CTV, they have a W5 program. One day they did a program called Campus Giveaway. Campus giveaway. They stay, yeah, uh, they, they, they program uh, the key point of that episode is that your sons and daughters cannot make it to the university 
because all these foreigners are taking the space. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called campus giveaway. And when they show foreigners, they show face of Asians. Mm -hmm. Except this is the University of Toronto, the pharmacy department. You have to be a land immigrant or Canadian in order to be a student. Just because they're Asian faces does not mean, did not mean that they are foreigners. Mm -hmm. So it was purely a racist program that uh, accused Chinese Canadian of ticking away uh, university seats. Your kids cannot get into U of T because of all these Asian ticking away your spaces. Mm -hmm. That's racist. Mm -hmm. So my group of friends said, hey, CTV, you need to apologize. Yeah, right, sure. They okay. ignored it, they ignored it, they ignored it. This is in 1980. Um, no, move on. Um, and we had demonstration, we had other people really calling them out, high profile folks. Uh, we created a network of centers all across Canada, because CTV is a national program, national TV, uh, all across Canada uh, demanding change. It got the first time they merely mouthed yada yada. You know, if we if you get offended, you know we're sorry. It wasn't good enough. We we wanted a formal apology. We wanted a a, a new episode um, mm -hmm. one. Uh, so that was the first time I got I participated in something political, not political like you know organizing. And from that on, I became more and more engaged. And then I got, oh, okay, this is what politics is about. It's about making change. It's about coming together. When you come together, you have the power to make the change you want if you do it correctly. Yeah. I got excited. So since then, a lot of things that are specific for the Asian community or for immigrant community, like when you call 911, if you cannot speak English, you, you're in trouble, right? You don't yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought, well, that's not fair. Why don't we have... 911 speak 150 languages. True. That's a good point. Well, like you, right now, if you call 911, if you only speak Cantonese or Vietnamese, it can speak your language. It's switch over. So if you're in trouble, you, need, you can't breathe, you need an ambulance, they understand you. If your house is on fire. If not, if you can't explain what is wrong, someone have a knife at your, you know, you know, someone broke into your house, you know, how would 911 know what you're asking for, right? So changes like that, uh, it always comes from the community, what the need of the community, and then I got involved to make the change. So we were able to win that battle, for example. Wow, and you won in the end. Did they actually apologize and everything? And W5, yeah, I apologize. Uh, 911, yes, it now has many languages. Plus, I, I've been involved in many different campaigns. Wow, that, that's amazing. And what is your motivation for your work? Like, what keeps you going despite having so many challenges, though? It's really hearing the story of people that are, that really need the mm -hmm. change. Um, Hearing the sorrow of Chinese seniors that came to oh. Canada to, to uh, build the railroad mm. and were not able to bring their wives and the kids over because Canada had a racist immigration policy that charged head tax and then banned all, all Chinese to come into this country. Mm -hmm. So hearing the voices of an elderly woman who was separated from her husband for 30 years because of this racist policy had to raise her kid alone or uh, the feeling of the son who never had a father growing up 
Yeah. I know, but that's the result of the racist policy we Canada had. That gave me the incentive to work together with them, mm -hmm. get the prime minister to apologize, to say, yes, sorry, that was a racist policy. Um, and here's the compensation. So they were people that had to pay a head tax were compensated at the time, $20,000. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, well, in today's $500 they had to pay was like 2 million. So this is like very small amount, but it's symbolic compensation. But anyway, that campaign took 23 years, but it started with me hearing these stories and meeting the widowers or the, 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 the people that were victim of these racist policy, hearing their stories, feeling the anger, the sorrow, the injustice, and working together with them to win the fight. And what were some strategies that you used to win against this fight? On that one, uh, we started the campaign in 1983. 1983. Uh, yeah, and we finally won in 2006. And we won because in the 2006 election, we the strategy was if we make this an election issue mm -hmm. and that the party will lose seats if they don't promise to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we created, and, and there was this unique opportunity if we're in the middle of a federal election mm -hmm. and it became an election issue so we targeted the Chinese Canadian community and say that, look, these guys just talk. All these years did nothing. Yeah. This is what needs to be done. If they don't do it, they are disrespecting the community and they are not worthy of your vote. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And we won. <laughs> that's really like inspiring and, to hear. Yeah, and the people that kept defending the status quo is not, no no apology in, in the House of Commons, he lost his seat. Okay, that's good, that's really good to hear. Yeah, but you know, it, 23 years is a long time to win the battle. And unfortunately, in between those years, a lot of the victims, because they were, a, a, a lot of the elderly, um, Chinese Canadian men uh, passed away Aww. so it was really the widow that was able to get get the final apology but it's not the compensation it's not the money is the sense of justice that they finally got what they mm -hmm. want but a anyway long story short <laughs> um, yeah so some campaigns takes a long time there's that saying too that change is slow there, it really or sometimes is. it's fast and sometimes, sometimes it's fast. The 911 was, 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 yeah, we went to the police service board. Well, no, it went, went two rounds. Um, it, we lost the first round. The second time we, we finally got it. So. so how did you get the 911 changes to happen? Like, just curious to how that went. How do I get started? The, the 911, uh, you mentioned the 911. Um, oh, I, um, we went to the police service board and, uh, we have a senior that started speaking only in one language and no one understood what she was talking about. I said, well, you know, here's an illustration. If, if, uh, if uh, someone came in to our house with a gun, you don't know that is yeah. the case. Oh boy, yeah. okay. Her yeah. house might be burning down. Can you tell that she's saying that to you? No. Her husband is choking and can't breathe. Can you tell? No. Then how do you know what, who to send? You know, if the guy, if there's someone robbing her that has a knife, you know, like, well, you, you should know that before you get there, right? So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that by giving these what-if scenarios, that's when people start to think, oh, what would I do well in that situation? Like, how awful would it be for me if I couldn't even communicate if I was in danger or I need help, right? So it really taps into people thinking, oh my gosh, no, that's awful. We need to change this. 
Well, also it dis they discovered that <clears throat> at first they thought it's going to be really expensive, and they discovered that um, it's actually cheaper to have these translation than sending the wrong folks out. They may not need an ambulance going out to them. They might mm -hmm. need just a cop to show yeah. up. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need the fire truck coming in. If, if someone is robbing someone, why do you want to send a fire department, right? I mean, it's expensive sending the fire department, but if you don't know, you send all three. Uh, that's Maybe. expensive, that's yeah. expensive, right? Yeah. Oh. It's actually cheaper to, to know exactly what the person need. That's a good point, Olivia. So that's how we won. <laughs> <laughs> financially, it's not just goodness of your heart. It's financially, it makes more sense. <clears throat> Money is, is a thing to consider after all. Yep. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say or add? Uh, what's one thing you want to change, Nancy? What's one thing I want to change? Oh, that's, that's such a big question. Okay, maybe I should start off small. Let me um, ask the other way. Let me ask another way. Why do you want to, why, why did you apply to be a placement person with Ken and that, uh, you know, to be, uh, you know, you obviously want something to do with social justice. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Um, I find that with, uh, I guess with my own experiences growing up, like I feel that it's, uh, I've noticed and seen so many cases where people are silent in some form. So uh, it could be something like maybe you eat dinner with your family every day, but then you, you can't even express your thoughts to them clearly because uh, perhaps there's someone who likes to silence other people. Maybe there's just completely different political views, et cetera, et cetera. And so I find that having voice is very important. And having that space to express your voice is very important, which, for example, can happen online. And with me and Ken, it started because I took a course with him. It's called Art and Social Transformation. And at first I didn't really expect too much. I thought, oh, it might be just a course we talk about art and then move on, like, you know, connect to social work somehow. But he ended up bringing so many examples and I respected him more after hearing it. So for example, he talked about, uh, you know, fan fiction can be a space where you hear, uh, express voice or cosplay. And those are like, sometimes not really like Western approaches to activities and expressing yourself. So when he brought different examples about how these are some ways you can express voice and you can actually advocate or share similarities and just again express your voice in these forms again i was like oh like i like that about him and then later on i found out that he's the jack layton chair and then when a uh, placement came around i was looking for a placement i asked ken if he had any uh, suggestions and he suggested that i become his placement student and then also going to events like i really like how open he is and just how everyone talks about different ways that they advocate and i don't have a particular uh I guess focus group at the moment, but I do think justice is important. And if we don't speak up, then oppression will happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's that feeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking up is good. Uh, and learning how to take that uh, that cause and link it to your friends, so you can bring some of the other people on board so you form a team. Because right now, <clears throat> in a lot of work that we, uh, the activists do, mm -hmm. is very individualistic. We go and sign a petition online. Yeah. We make yeah. an individual phone call. Even going to a rally is individualistic. You go to a rally, you participate, you go home, right? Yeah. You don't actually form <clears throat> a core group locally, mm -hmm. and develop develop a core uh, a core team to do the work. And I think uh, if I could leave with one thought is um, think about collective. If the stronger mm -hmm. relationship with your team, the more power you have. So power is not just being elected or rich or having a 50,000 mm -hmm. name on a mailing list, having a big petition. Power is really how strong is your core team, your relationship with your team and the talents that they have and, 
and from there you have the power to make the change you want so teamwork especially in this very individualistic society that we have um, is very very important and often i find the the in we only talk to the uh political class yeah which is about 10 percent of the population the other 90 percent they are not involved in politics they they go to about their life daily lives they don't go to rally sign petitions or do anything and yeah. if we keep talking to the 10 15 percent then we're not reaching to the people especially those that are most stressed out because they don't have the funds, they don't have the money, they mm -hmm. live in poor housing, they're stressed out, they work two, three or four jobs or they have no jobs, they're depressed, they don't feel hopeful, they don't feel they have the power to make the change. So I oh. think it's important that in all the work we do to make changes is to connect with those people that are directly being impacted by the policy and have them engage. That's what true political organizing is about. True political organizing. I like that phrasing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's almost time for us to go. All right. Thank okay. you so much uh, <clears throat> for this. And uh, check us out at changeleaders.ca. And uh, I hope we can uh, connect and find ways to work on a campaign together. Oh, thank you so much, Olivia. And also, anyone watching this video, take SSH 502 if you can. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Not too late to sign up. <laughs> Is there a deadline? <clears throat> well, you know, September class starts and, you know, September. Do it okay. September. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It'll be online. It'll be lots of fun. Don't worry. Yay. Thank you so much, Olivia. All right. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.